Thanks very much for the invitation to take take part in this uh, series. It's uh, it's great to have these these sorts of events where people can come together on the internet and uh, take 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 part in talks like this. And I I know I've certainly been a a beneficiary of uh, of speaker series of of this form, and so it's uh, nice to be able to contribute to one of them. Um, so what I want to uh, talk about. To, to today was a, a particular issue in data science algorithms and machine learning, which has been getting an increasingly increasing amount of attention, which is questions about fairness and bias that, are, that, are, that arise when we're in contexts where algorithms are making uh, decisions about, about in individuals. And what I'll be talking about is um, some joint work I've been doing with uh, three co-authors in particular recently um, uh, actually, the four of us representing four distinct uh, areas of study. So uh, Jens Ludwig, uh, a public policy researcher at the University of Chicago, um, Sentil Mulanathan, uh, a behavioral economist also at the uh, University of Chicago, and Cass Sunstein, a law professor at, at Harvard. Okay, um, so the, our work on this began in a sense through the observation um, that there were issues going on in computer science and algorithm design and machine learning that were beginning to intersect with questions in, in pub public policy and the behavioral sciences. And this, this observation in my own work be began with some collaborations I was doing with Sentel beginning roughly 2011. Um, and we began noticing that so certain kinds of questions that we were asking in computer science were becoming quite similar to questions that we were seeing uh, in policy domains. So for example, just to start with something that we can all recognize um, as, as com computer scientists, uh, one thing that computer science has gotten extremely good at doing is problems related to ranking and recommendations. So this is a screenshot from a, a Netflix help page in which they attempt to explain how they arrive at recommendations for uh, movies that you might want to see. So for example, based on your past viewing history and the viewing history of other people, they take some movie. And actually, if I move the mouse pointer, I guess you guys can see that, I think, right? So um, if, that, if that works as a way to do it. Nice. Um, OK, great. Um, you know, so they take some movie and you know, uh, they look at all this past historical data and they make an estimate that you're going to rate this 4.3 stars or they assign some probability to the event that you're going to like this movie. And so in a way, this is following a template that's very familiar to us in algorithm design and machine learning, which is to take an individual, some person with complex tastes and some complex past life history, reduce them to a feature vector, pass that feature vector through an algorithm and estimate the probability of, of some event. And a lot of the discussion here starts from the observation that there are activities that take place in the offline world that fit this basic template. If you start going around looking for this template, you can find it in a lot of places. So for example, when someone applies for a job, what they do is you know, often they construct a resume, they submit it to a prospective employer, and effectively what they've done is taken their complex past life experiences, reduced it to this tabular collection of features, which in some symbolic form represents what they think of as some relevant uh, attributes about themselves. It goes to an employer and the employer looks at it and again, tries to estimate, well, here things get a little fuzzy. It's not clear exactly what the employer is trying to estimate, but they're trying to make some, and we'll come back to that, but they're trying to make some decision that will ultimately result in a judgment about whether to hire this person or not. A uh, similar thing happens with college admissions, for example, someone takes their complex K through 12 history with all of the intricacies that it had, reduce it to the information on a college application, and then ultimately an admissions committee, again, with a relatively opaque, unclear objective, make some kind of a decision about them. So that's sort of the common theme in, in, in a lot of these areas and in many, many more. The idea of screening as some sort of a prediction problem, some sort of a problem that has where I'm trying to estimate the outcome of some individual. So in the case of, a, you know, in domains like employment, a hiring decision is turning on some sort of a only partially formulated prediction of how this person will do as an employee at this company. You know, education with emissions decisions. In the area of 
credit, uh, there are cases, and, and again, these are challenging, uh, often contentious cases, where sometimes the prediction problem is even more explicit, right? We would like to predict if this person will successfully repay a loan. And again, this person with some complex life history and financial history uh, gets reduced to some feature vector uh, that we then use for a prediction like that. And in one of the most uh, challenging domains of all for these kinds of questions in criminal justice, there's a place where the law, again, um, asks a judge to make a prediction and that's in pretrial detention where the law specifies that a defendant after being arrested for a crime can await trial out in the community rather than in jail if the judge believes that they will return for their court appearance without committing a crime in the meantime. Again, uh, a case where a human being is being asked to make a, a prediction. So in all of these cases, um, we have sort of this, this pipeline that I've been describing. An individual map to features pass through some decision-making entity, be it a human or an algorithm, uh, who then is attempting to place probabilities on certain events that then inform their decision. And this, this, this move from the online domain, right, where we had perfected these kinds of techniques on things like recommendations, uh, online content delivery, online ad placement, um, into the offline world was, on the one hand, sort of a natural question to ask, because if computer science has gotten very good at making predictions, uh, why not make them in other domains where the, the structure or even the law calls for the making of a uh, prediction? On the other hand, other aspects of this seem quite different. We often think of the uh, problems described on this slide in employment, education, credit, or criminal justice as so-called high stakes decisions. And the reason is that each individual decision uh, matters a lot to the person that the decision is being made about. So it matters a lot to someone whether they get offered a job or not by a prospective employer. Uh, it can matter a lot whether you, you, you receive a loan. Certainly for pretrial detention, the question of whether someone awaits trial in jail or in the community is an enormously consequential decision for that person. Whereas in contrast, the areas in which we had sort of honed some of these techniques, um, the individual decisions are clearly much lower stakes, right? In the end, it doesn't matter that much if Netflix was wrong about whether you were going to like this movie. Um, it doesn't matter enormously whether the top ranked search result that you received is exactly the right one for you. Now, this high stakes versus low stakes is of course, as with all these things, somewhat subtle because um, as we've seen over the past few years, I take um, you know things like uh, placement of news content, placement of search results, sharing of social media, I take 100 billion individually low stakes decisions and I add them all up and I can get something that feels kind of high stakes like the formation of public opinion, uh, the outcome of political processes. And so even in the domains that we think of as lo low stakes, the aggregate effect can be, can be uh, significant. But the, the point in the domains we're talking about here employment, education, and so forth, is that each individual decision matters a lot to somebody. So this is the point where we uh, began thinking about these connections between algorithms and human decision-making in, in these kinds of domains. And a key point here is that in all of these domains, there's a profound risk of bias uh, entering into the decisions that are, are being made. And this is true for human decisions, and increasingly we're seeing it's true for algorithmic decisions as well. And it's increasingly becoming an issue for really all machine learning methodologies that are being brought to bear here. And so I want to talk about some of the ways that we might think both about human and algorithmic bias and also the analogies and the contrasts between them. And in order to do that, because these systems uh, have really existed for a long time, the ones I'm talking about on the slide, have existed for a long time in, in the offline world, in the human world, I wanted to start with human bias and some things that, that, we, that we know about human bias so that when we start thinking about and bringing algorithms into the picture, we can appreciate not just the analogies but also some of the profound contrasts in, in, in what's going on. So human bias, of course there's different flavors of, of human bias. There can be explicit human bias in which someone is consciously choosing to discriminate against certain groups. Um, there's also more, more complex things such as implicit bias bias where people may not even be consciously aware that they're engaging in uh, biased behavior or producing outcomes that have profound differences across groups. This is a, a line of 
research that, that really gathered momentum in the behavioral science literature through the, through the 80s and especially through the 1990s. Um, and a, a number of empirical studies really drove home how pervasive this phenomenon can be. Um, just to take a, a, a couple of examples, um, in, in one quite highly cited paper now from the 1990s by two uh, social scientists from uh, Sweden, Christine Benevoss and Agnes Vold, they asked for uh, reviews of European grant proposals. And essentially they requested review information under some version of a, a freedom of information process. And, and the way these proposals worked was there, one of, the, uh, well, one of the measures that the reviewers were asked to include was a so-called competence score for the PI. How professionally successful has this PI been thus far to date in their career? And what they did was they created a, a, a plot, they created a, a number of plots like the, the one that you see on the right-hand side of the slide, where the y-axis is the score that was given by the reviewers to a particular PI, a particular applicant. And on the x-axis, they tried in many, many different ways to come up with some sort of you know, numerical uh, measure of how you might measure past professional success. So some you know, measure combining citation counts, publications and top venues, previous grants received, lots of different ways of creating these scores. And essentially, no matter how you did this, you had something like this plot that we see here which is that for a fixed level of total numerical impact as measured by these citation and past funding metrics, um, the average uh, competence score given by reviewers to PIs who were women was significantly lower than the average uh, common score to uh, PIs who were men. And so the, the point here is that there's this gap, right? This gap depending on gender, even after we attempt to find people who, you know, to every measure that we can bring, bring to bear have comparable past professional track records. Now, it's of course, you know, it's of course a, a huge methodological challenge to engage in a study like this because in the end, the people you're comparing are different human beings. They're different people. Each of them has some long past track record and those track records are different. And so we produce these num numerical measures. We see the strong evidence of a disparity, but we are dealing with different people. There was a question, is there any way we could get rid of the sort of challenge that we had different people? And, my, uh, well, one of my co-authors on this line of work I'm talking about here, it's Sentil Mullenothan, in actually one of, his, uh, one of his early pieces of research early on in his career with Marion Bertrand, uh, did something which has subsequently become one of the most replicated uh, social science experiments of the past 25 years. They took this question, you know, how can we compare people from different groups and look for evidence of a disparity? And they attempted to make those people as identical as possible. So they took uh, fictitious resumes, they sent them out to employers. And the only thing they varied was the name at the top of the resume. They went into US census records and they found names that um, either st statistically were highly associated with um, people who were white or with people who were African-American. Okay, so two different names at the top of the resume designed to get employers to think that the person they're looking at uh, came from one racial group or the other. And what they discovered is that the callback rates, right, we would like you to come in to interview for this job based on your resume, um, the, the successful callback rates for applicants who employers based on the name were likely to believe were African-American were only two thirds as large as the applicants uh, uh, who had names that caused employers to think that they were white. In other words, absolutely identical resumes, only the name at the top was different, and this large gap uh, in, 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 in outcomes, right? So an extremely strong ind indication that there, is, uh, uh, that there is this kind of bias going on. I, I would point out a couple of things about this uh, experiment because it'll matter for what, what, what we talk about in the future in, in, in the subsequent slides. Um, first, we don't know what any one person was thinking when they looked at these resumes. All we know was whether they contacted, in this case, Marianne and Sendel pretending to be these applicants, whether they contact them and asked them to come in for a job interview. But we don't actually know what process was going on by which they arrived at that decision. Second, we don't really even know which of these people were engaging in bias. We simply know that in aggregate, some non-trivial fraction of them uh, were exhibiting a, a difference in their behaviors given that we have randomly split populations. Okay, so, we can see aggregate evidence of some form of bias. It's very hard to attribute it 
to any one person or any one process of, of decision making. Now, in those kinds of situations, that creates a challenge in discrimination law, which after all has been designed for humans, right? Discrimination law has been designed for humans who've been discriminated against to bring legal action against other humans who've been making those decisions. Um, and an important thing that uh, to sort of think about, and, uh, and this is really something that Cass Sunstein, the legal scholar in our group really brought to the fore in these conversations is the sense in which uh, the law around discrimination really is at least implicitly motivated by things we know about human psychology. So that's the first thing that I actually wanted to talk about in this uh, rough out outline of the talk, that in order to think about human decisions, we need to sort of interpret why those decisions were made. And this is sort of intriguing because we often uh, now talk in machine learning about the problem of interpretability, the problem that algorithms are hard to understand, that they're opaque, we're not sure what they're doing. And, and often, um, for those of us like me who don't come from a behavioral science background, you know, I often don't sort of actively think about the fact that the behavioral sciences have long wrestled with an interpretability problem for human beings. We also don't know why human beings make the decisions that they do. Uh, and so I, I wanted to start from there. Then I want to talk about ways in which uh, we have both analogies and contrasts with the way algorithms make uh, decisions. Think about the bias that arises in algorithm, algorithmic prediction and how we might decompose it. And finally, get to a point about when we think about interpretability and the complexity of the rules that people are using, we might think of complexity as, as the enemy. Uh, but in fact, simplicity in rules can cause problems also. And so to think about the relation between complexity, simplicity, and the equity of the, the decisions that we make, okay? All right, so let's start with uh, discrimination law for humans. So, the doctrine around discrimination law, of course, it's considerable, but for purposes of this, uh, of this talk, let me mention the, by far the two sort of most important concepts in discrimination law, which are disparate treatment and dis disparate impact. And these are effectively two different categories of uh, discrimination that someone can invoke as a claim uh, if they believe that uh, discrimination has occurred. So, Dis disparate treatment is, in a sense, the simpler one to define succinctly. Um, it means that someone is deliberately uh, in engaging in a preference for uh, applicants that they're screening based on some protected attribute, as in that they have a deliberate bias based on things like race, gender, national origin, religion, age, and other attributes that under the law, uh, you're not allowed to take into account, stay for um, uh, activities like uh, hiring for employment. Um, and if you want, we'll think about hiring as sort of a running example through all of this. Uh, although it's sort of crucial to keep in mind that the law in each of these individual domains is distinct. There's a, a distinct body of law for hiring, a distinct body of law for lending and so forth. Um, but at the level of defining discrimination, these two categories, disparate treatment, and it, disparate impact or uh, useful general principles. That's disparate treatment. Disparate impact says regardless of intent, if a decision has a disproportionate adverse effect on a protected group, whether or not you intended to discriminate against them, the legal burden now shifts to you to establish so-called business necessity. Namely the question, was this actually, uh, were your decisions is sort of necessary for advancing the success of, of your business, which would then be a, a potential defense against the, uh, the adverse effect. Right? Again, it's crucial in the second branch that you were not deliberately in, engaging in, in discrimination, but rather you were invoking something that may have had this adverse impact. For example, uh, if you are hiring people for some job involving physical labor, where it's absolutely essential that the people uh, taking part in this physical labor have to be at least six feet tall or, or they simply can't perform the job, then hiring people who are at least six feet tall may be defensible under business necessity, even if that means, for example, that more men get hired than women. On the other hand, if you're hiring people to write software and you've decided to impose a requirement that everyone must be at least six feet tall, it'd be hard to justify that, presumably on grounds of business necessity because we don't really see an apparent reason why writing software requires that you be at least 
um, six, six feet tall. So that's the business necessity uh, defense in the case of disparate impact. Now, the, the, the challenge here is that it can be very hard to tell if someone has engaged in disparate treatment or disparate impact. Were they deliberately discriminating based, uh, based on a, a protected attribute? And similarly, it can be very hard to tell in the case of disparate impact, why did they actually introduce this criterion? Why is it hard? Well, one reason is, of course, they might just be lying, right? They might have, ha have actually wanted to engage in uh, deliberate favoritism, but they invented, they reverse engineered a rationale so that it, it would appear to be on the, on the surface neutral. But there's sort of a deeper reason why it can be very hard to tell if someone has engaged in discrimination. And this goes back to this literature on in, implicit bias. The person might genuinely not know their rationale. The person might in good faith be trying to explain to you why they made their decision. Um, and, they, and they might simply be incorrect in the rationale that they're giving you. Now, how do we know that? I mean, it's intriguing to think that that might be what's going on, but is that actually what's, what's going on? So in this, it's actually interesting to look at um, a line of work of what are by now classic experiments in psychology and, and the, the behavioral sciences, which I actually only really first encountered in this line of work. I, I feel like in the computer science community, we haven't uh, encountered these uh, experiments as much, but quite illuminating in, in thinking about sort of the interpretability problem for human de decision-making. So one of the sort of catalytic papers in this area was by Nisbet and Wilson in 1977. And what they would do is run these experiments um, with two groups, A and B. Uh, and in, in both cases, they would, they would ask them to come in and make a certain decision or engage in a certain activity. And between the two groups, A and B, they would change just a single thing about the environment, some very subtle thing about the environment that was different. Um, that would be enough to cause the two groups to make different kinds of decisions, or at least have a different distribution over their decisions. But when you would ask people why they made the decisions they made, no one made reference to this confounder that, that we had introduced. Let me give you an example, because that's, that's a very abstract formulation. Here's a very concrete version. Um, I'm gonna do an experiment where I ask you to name you know, a kind of product, a brand name, some, something like that. I'm gonna ask you to name a brand of laundry detergent. But the way I'm gonna do that is I'm first going to ask you to memorize a whole list of words. Okay, so I'll say, please memorize the following list of eight words and then recite them back to me. After which I'll ask you, and then I'll ask you to name this brand of laundry detergent. In group A, that's what I do. Group B, I do the same thing, except the words I ask you to memorize are things like beach, ocean, moon, sand, and so forth. And in group B, where they have to memorize those words, many more people say tide as their brand of laundry detergent. Why is that? Because I prime them. That's priming. I get you to think of a lot of words that are nearest neighbors of the word I want you to think of. And then when I ask you to think of a word, your brain sort of goes to it. So that's how associative memory works. That we understand very well. Nisbet and Wilson used that as a substrate on which to do this final clever twist to their experiment. They asked the people, why did you pick the brand name that you, that you chose? And people would say all sorts of reasons. They would say, it's because it's the brand that we used when I was a child at home, or it's the brand I use now, or I like the logo, or I remember seeing it at the store when I was there last week, something. No one said, because you primed me with these choices of words, right? Even though we know that that was literally the only difference in these two conditions, right? The only reason that more people in group B, significantly more said tied, is because of that one change, but no one noticed that. But despite not noticing it, everybody was perfectly happy to provide explanations for their, um, for their decision, explanations that we know in a lot of cases were simply not correct. Okay, um, there were a lot of experiments of this form in uh, Nisbet and Wilson, um, and I, I won't run through all of them, but for example, they would stand outside a clothing store with a rack of articles of clothing, and they would ask people to choose which one they, they liked the most. And sort of like a stage magician forcing a card on somebody, they would tilt the rack of clothes so that 70% of people would choose the rightmost one. But again, when asked why, uh, why they chose the, this particular article of clothing, they would mention the color or the style or things like this. No one mentioned the orientation of the rack, which we knew was actually the reason why I like it. So they referred to this as the activity of telling more than we can know, right? We actually made the decision for some other reason. So, but we, 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 we gave an explanation uh, that, that didn't align. This is the challenge. Humans give the illusion of interpretability. 
when you ask someone why they did something, they are happy to volunteer an explanation and even justify that explanation. Uh, it doesn't mean that's why they were actually doing what, what they were doing. And this is fundamentally part of the challenge, part of the huge challenge of asking um, whether there was discrimination or bias in particular cases. You can ask the person, the person might even be motivated to help you. The person might genuinely believe that really bias played absolutely no role in their decision-making. And the point is we really can't know that. So here's something fascinating about the introduction of algorithms into this picture. We can discuss whether algorithms are exacerbating bias or reducing bias. And that is a, a question that I'll continue addressing as we go on the talk. But let's make a different point. Let's make an orthogonal point that at the very least, certainly all the indications are that well-regulated algorithms can potentially make discrimination easier to detect. Why is that? Well, so, so first of all, let's get clear sort of a few things that we might be talking about. When we talk about an algorithm in, in, in these high stakes domains, of course, we really mean two algorithms, right? Because what is machine learning? It's a, it's a training algorithm that takes input data. It takes a run through pipeline and produces an algorithm, a classifier, right? So a training algorithm in machine learning is really an algorithm that produces in a second algorithm. So there's the trainer and then there's the classifier that, that comes out. And this is actually not a trivial point. If you go and read um, not just the popular media, but even the policy literature on uh, algorithmic decision-making or discrimination by algorithms, people often talk about analyzing what, quote, the algorithm is doing. And often if you ask yourself, which algorithm are they talking about, the trainer or the classifier, it becomes somewhat hard to tell. And, and, and so it's important to, to keep in mind that these, these are distinct and what you're allowed to do with one may be different from what you're allowed to do with the other. But the point is, if we follow that standard machine learning pipeline. We collect training data, we run a training algorithm with a clear objective function, and after optimizing the objective function, out comes a classifier that has good performance on out of sample test data. We could imagine a world in which all of that is actually recorded and accessible to a regulator who's trying to audit for discrimination. In that case, there are many, many things we could do with that decision-making process that we couldn't do with human decision-makers, right? We can't necessarily read the code and expect to understand the algorithm, right? It's cognitively enormously difficult to understand code, not to mention undecidability problems tell us that we provably can't necessarily understand what the code is doing. But we can do some other things. We can, for example, um, examine the features that you chose to collect, because we know these were exactly the features that were accessible to the algorithm. We can examine the objective function, right? You are, the algorithm is optimizing some objective uh, in say this hiring process in a way that uh, is very hard to extract from humans. It's very hard to ask a human hiring committee or a human being tasked with hiring or some other selection process, what objective function were you maximizing? Um, they can tell you this in general terms, in subjective terms, even in relatively, for humans, relatively precise terms, but there's really no chance that you're gonna extract from a human being the actual objective function that they were using to the extent that there even was one. We can also, for example, take the same data that uh, the firm being investigated was using, right? We're investigating a firm for discrimination. Um, we could try to build our own screening rule from the data. We could discover, for example, right? As in say the Netflix prize competition where teams competed to improve on the performance of an existing benchmark. We could say, we went back to your data with your same objective function and we simply built our own rule and it had better performance and was less discriminatory, which again, uh, provides evidence that what you were doing was, you know, if not discriminatory, at the very least, uh, non-optimal. Similarly, the classifier that comes out, we can ask it questions that you could never ask to a human being. We could create synthetic instances, for example. We could do effectively what Marianne and Sendel did with their resume study, and we could run thousands of those instances. We could say, I took this applicant and I flipped one bit, right, or I changed their gender, and I fed it back to the classifier, and I just saw what happened. I changed the age of this person up or down by five years and I saw what happened. Um, it's again, effectively impossible to ask a human being, what would you have thought about this applicant had they been five years younger? They're happy to offer you an answer. They're happy to say, oh, that would have made no difference to me. But again, 30 years of behavioral science research says we just have no reason to believe that even if they're well-intentioned. So of course, all of this you know, hinges on this term well-regulated. Uh, we, in order to do all of this, we would actually need access to the features, the labels, the objective function. 
Um, because without that, right, if the algorithm is opaque and hidden and not accessible to regulators or to people who are bringing legal action, then all that we have is an actor with potentially bad intent who now has an additional powerful tool at their disposal, namely the algorithm. So this is all saying in the presence of record keeping re requirements, which would in, you know, in, in particular require changes to some of the existing uh, regulatory framework around this. Now, you might say that's completely infeasible. Think of how much data would have to be retained. But in other domains where we're concerned about social harms, huge record keeping requirements apply. So in financial markets, for example, <clears throat> enormous volumes of data must be retained so as to be able to audit the functioning and, and the sort of reasonable functioning of a market. And so the, the, the point is in cases where the policy apparatus has an interest in doing this, it's, it's possible to do it. Okay, so all of this su suggests some of the places where bias can come into an algorithm, right? So for example, if we use, uh, right, it can come in in the choice of the label or what we're optimizing. It can come in in the choice of features. Uh, it can come in, in the training procedure itself, right? So for example, if in place of, um, you know, sort of the actual job performance that we're trying to optimize for, the label that we use is say, manager evaluations and manager evaluations are biased because the manager as a human being is biased, um, then we might in fact be optimizing toward a biased target. Similarly in features, right? When we collect features about somebody, maybe one of those features are letters of recommendation. And those are produced by people who again, may be biased to write stronger letters of recommendation for certain types of people than others. And finally, the training procedure, um, we're at the mercy of the training data that we collect if it's non-representative of the population that we're studying. Um, if it's based on data that's from an era when the conditions were different than they are now, for all these reasons, we might actually get bias in the, in the training procedure as well. One thing that was sort of intriguing here was to un understand, do we actually, we ran through all, all these sources of bias. You could ask the question, are these all the sources of bias? Is this it? Is it really in the choice of label? you know, on the output, the choice of feature on the input, and the choice of training procedure on the internals. And so um, in order to think about have we missed anything, it was useful to write down the very simple model, which I'll also, also, also use for uh, some of the subsequent discussion. Let's imagine the following model. So I collect a feature vector X for each individual. Um, there's some function, which is the optimization function that say is truly what we care about. It may be hard to write down, maybe hard to express, but it's at some level underlying everything is what, we, what we're hoping to optimize. That's some function f of x, which we call a productivity function. We're concerned about discrimination of one group against another. So let's say an advantage group and a disadvantage group, A and D. And we're concerned about discrimination against the disadvantage group. Now, each group, and so let's, let's make the following assumption that conditional on all of these features x, that's everything I need to know about someone to evaluate their productivity. So their group membership does not actually matter. But the sense in which one group is advantaged is that they have a better distribution of features that lead to higher productivity. Okay, so feature vectors leading to more productivity are more abundant in the advantage group and maybe less abundant in the disadvantage group. But conditional on X, the group doesn't actually matter. So that says for any function that I'm interested in, let's call it V, there's a D of V, this operator on V, which is a kind of disparity. Um, which is simply the expected value of V on group A minus the expected value of, of uh, V on group D. Right? So just the measure weighted sum of all the values. Okay, so in particular, we could apply that to our productivity function F. And if we apply it to our productivity function F, it gives what people call structural disadvantage. It's the difference in average value of F purely based on the different distribution of feature vectors across these groups. But now once we start using an algorithm, <clears throat> the decision begins morphing, right? And it morphs in the following ways. First, um, the algorithm designer who's trying to evaluate applicants, F may be too complicated to actually evaluate or to even know or to write down. So the algorithm designer uses some other function, G. Similarly, the full feature vector of everything that might be relevant to this decision is presumably enormous. It's hard to use all of it. And so the algorithm designer might use a reduced representation. Instead of x, call it r of x for reducing x. Now, a bit of a, a sort of small syntactic point. If I'm using r of x instead of x, then I can't really plug that directly into g, which expects x. So I have to plug it into a shrunken function. Let's call it h. 
So really, rather than evaluating g of x, I'm really evaluating h of r of x, right? h composed of r. And finally, I don't really have perfect access to even h because I have a finite amount of training data on which I'm training my classifier. And so really, what I produce is not h composed with r, but some trained rule t composed with r. And so now the point is, if you sort of run through this formalism, then you see that, in fact, these three kinds of places where bias can come in, namely in the choice of objective or label, the choice of features and the training procedure, in some sense, almost syntactically, is all of the places where this can come in. Because if I look at the disparity induced by my trained rule, t composed with r, I can decompose it as follows, just by the simple telescoping sum. It's d of f plus d of g minus d of f, to take out d of f, plus d of h composed with r minus d of g, plus d of d composed with r minus d of h composed with r. And writing it this way, I see that each term has some meaning in what we've talked about so far. D of, s, d of f is the original structural disadvantage, right? The disparity that existed upstream of my decision process. Before I ever showed up to build a classifier, there was already d of f existing in the world. D of f might be something that we want to work hard to correct, but it's not something that was introduced by our decision. But then we have this gap, which is the bias from the choice of outcome. We use g instead of f. Uh, this gap from the choice of features, and then this gap from the training procedure. Okay, so all of this suggests that when we have algorithms, there's really this opportunity for both computational analysis and, in fact, computational models to identify the different mechanisms leading to bias. Right? Because the point is that establishing a claim of discrimination fundamentally involves attributing the gap you observe to different components of the decision. That's traditionally extremely hard for human beings, right? The idea that you know we could in principle, write down this notional decomposition, perhaps for humans. But given that humans are really unable to be explicit about their objective function, what they attended to when they were actually evaluating this person, or how they even arrived at the heuristics that they were using, this, is, this, this would be purely speculative. We could never really talk about these quantities as though they had some um, accessible meaning. In the case of algorithms, we can, in principle, actually access these things and ask, where is the disparity coming from? Where did, that, where did the largest of, uh, of these gaps happen? But of course, just because we're using algorithms doesn't make this automatic. It's really the necessary, to, necessary to actually collect that information and to examine it. Now, with that in mind, I want to delve into one area where a computational model, I think, sort of helped us in thinking at a theoretical level about some of the ways in which bias can creep into a process. Um, and in particular, the way in which structural disadvantage can sort of follow a slippery slope and turn into bias on the part of the decision maker, right? So recall that I was talking about st structural disadvantage, the distribution of features across advantaged and disadvantaged groups, which all happened upstream of the decision. But it turns out, as I'll argue next, it's sort of with relatively little apparent happening, that can start to turn into bias on the part of the decision maker. Okay. And it's related to the issue of complexity and simplicity in the decision rule, right? So the uninterpretability of algorithms, the uninterpretability of humans, we might ask the question, what happens as we try to simplify the rules that people are using? We often think of that as, as a good thing. As the rule becomes simpler, it becomes easier to understand what's going on. Perhaps it's easier to discover bias. But I, I want to argue that something risky also, also happens, okay? And the risky thing that also happens in the behavioral sciences we could think of as sort of a mechanism for where negative stereotypes come from. In the computer science literature, you can think about it as the question of what is the connection between two themes that are very much in people's minds, fairness and interpretability, right? On a first look, there are certainly a lot of benefits to interpretability, right? It allows us to look at algorithms and sort of try to use our own human domain knowledge to try understanding whether other kind of criteria are met. But I want to argue that interpretability can also come with a risk, and in particular, a risk for fairness. Um, in order to do that, let me go back to the model that uh, we were using a couple slides ago. And actually, let me just kind of add a bit to it here. Uh, this is basically what I was talking about before. Let's say applicants are described by a feature vector x. And again, because I, I want to write down examples that we can actually work through on the, on the, on the slides, I'll make this a Boolean feature vector. Right, so a bunch of zero one attributes that I think of as affecting the productivity. Of this person. 
Again, there's now a real valued Boolean function mapping Boolean vectors to real numbers, which gives the productivity. And my plan for hiring people or for admitting them to college or whatever is to sort them by their F value and admit the top R fraction. So I have some admission rate R. I'm just going to sort by F and take the top R fraction. And if I could perfectly access F, and if I could perfectly compute you know, F of X, then this is what I would do. OK, now we're concerned about disparities between groups. So again, there's group A and group D, advantage and disadvantage. So there's sort of an extended feature vector, X comma A or X comma D. But again, conditional on this feature vector X, it doesn't matter what group people belong to. X contains everything I need to know for the decision. Um, A and D are simply extraneous. What they do affect is the distribution of features. So in particular, again, mu of x comma a or mu of x comma d is the fraction of the population that has features x in group a or d. And here I'll express disadvantage as follows, what I'll, through what I'll call a likelihood ratio condition, which means <clears throat> if I have a better feature vector leading to better productivities and a worse feature vector x prime leading to worse productivity, then the relative abundance of x is higher in group a uh, than the, for x than for the worst feature vector x prime. Okay, so better feature vectors are even more relatively abundant in the advantage group than in the disadvantage. Okay, and that's that's the disadvantage condition that I will think about here. Okay, let's try this in an example. Okay, so here is an extremely simple example, much simpler than we would obviously encounter in any real situation, but actually simple enough that we could actually work through it in real time on these slides. Okay, so there are two Boolean feature vectors that are relevant to me, right? So Maybe the first one is, I'm hiring people and the first one, if you want in this, well, this is of course too simple to really metaphorically map onto almost anything, but you know, X1 is your educational attainment, you know, high or low, and X2 is your past work experience, high or low, okay? Um, and ones are good. The true criterion that I actually am trying to optimize for is a conjunction of X and X1 and X2. Um, and the distribution of features works as follows. Applicants from group A have each variable set to one with probably two thirds independently. And applicants from group D have each variable set to one with probably one third independently. Okay. Again, this is the sense of structural disadvantage without there being bias. If I know the values of X1 and X2, I don't care what group someone comes from. Nonetheless, the advantage group in aggregate has a significant advantage because they have many more people who have ones than uh, group D does. So this is the full truth table, giving the values and with, with the group, also giving the fraction of the population that has each of these. Okay, so what would happen? Well, if I knew all of this, if I set any admission rate R up to 5 18 the fraction of ones in my population, um, then all the admitted people would have an F value of one, which is the best possible. And a one fifth fraction of them would come from group D. Great. Now, Let's imagine that we're in some universe where this rule seems a bit too complex. Of course, a conjunction of two variables in most worlds is not too complex, but let's imagine we try to simplify it right? as, as a sort of worked example of cases where we might simplify a much more complex rule. Suppose we decide to simplify by only collecting x1, not also x2. Why is that? Maybe x2 is too expensive to collect. Maybe for the sake of interpretability, we want a more streamlined rule. Maybe we're regularizing. And for out of sample generalization, we'd like to only use a few variables. Lots of reasons why we might want to do it. What happens now? Well, so now instead of this truth table, I have this reduced truth table over here on the left, right? All I know is whether X1 is equal to one or zero. <clears throat> and I average over, every, over everybody there. So now when I go to pick, say admit people from this top group, I'm picking essentially a random sample from them because I can't distinguish them. So imagine I'm now just pulling uniformly randomly from that group. The average value of F in that group, you can work it out from the truth table is five nines. And half the population has that. Okay. So I'll call this truth table on the left an F approximator. It takes certain subsets of rows and just collapses them down. And it averages the F values. And then what I do is with an F approximator, I sort the rows in the F approximator. I take them in like that. And of course, within a row, all I can do is pull randomly. So what happens now? Well, now at all admission rates uh, are up to 5 18 um, like I had before, the average F value is now 5 9 and not 1. But the fraction from group D is now one third, not one fifth. So relative to the true F, we have a picture that's kind of familiar to us. We have gains in equity, right? In other words, group D is now one third represented, not one fifth. But we have a loss in efficiency. We're getting people of average value five nines, not one. 
And often when we think about simplifying in this way to remove a variable like x2 that confers disadvantage, we think in terms of this trade-off. And we do get that benefit. But I want to point out two things that we've introduced into this picture, um, which sort of maybe cause for, cause for some concern. Here's the first one. The first one is uh, this thing I've been kind of hinting at and can now make concrete, that the process of simplifying a rule can transform disadvantage into bias. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So we had this F approximator over on the right. Now, in the beginning, when I had the full truth table, let's back up and look at the full truth table, here it was. Um, if I had asked you, I had shown you X1 and X2, and I asked, would you also like to know the group membership of this person? Would you like to know if they belong to group A or D? You would have said, no, I have no interest in that. It does not help me evaluate their productivity. And so you would have had no incentive to go trying to learn this protected attribute A or D. With this approximator, if I were to ask you, would you also like to learn the value of the group membership? You would say, yes, in fact, I would find it useful to know the group membership of this person because the group membership gives me conditional information about the variable that I can't see, x2. And so if I were to take this simple f approximator and blow it up into this more pernicious one that uses x1 and the value of the group they belong to, I would actually be doing better in terms of optimizing f because I could now take people of average f value two thirds at the top rather than five ninths, okay? So essentially, there previously had been no incentive to engage in biased behavior. Uh, there was only structural disadvantage. But once I simplified the rule, there suddenly became an incentive to engage in biased behavior. And what's interesting is that this actually corresponds to something that we recognize in the behavioral sciences, a basic mechanism for stereotype formation in, in everyday life. People often say, we are most at risk of, for, of falling back on negative stereotypes or stereotypes at all, when we're operating in low information environments with a, a very partial picture of what's going on. And we tend to supplement that with negative stereotypes. And we think of this as a very human thing to do, right? It's something where you try to work out of our own behavior, but something humans fall back on. But this says even four line truth tables fall back on that behavior, right? It happens very, very naturally the instant you start suppressing relevant information to the decision. Um, you can sort of see reflections of this in models, for example, of statistical discrimination. And maybe troublingly, you actually, we've seen it in recent um, very creative, very incisive empirical studies of human decision-making. So let me tell you about one of those. Um, there are these policies in a number of jurisdictions uh, called ban the box policies. And what that refers to is that historically on employment applications, um, there was a box you checked. And the question was, check this box if you have a prior criminal conviction um, so that the employer could know about that. People wanted to remove that. They wanted to ban the box, make it illegal to ask that question on employment applications as a way of helping people who had been released from prison, having served sentences, reintegrate into the workforce. We would like that not to be a stigma that they carry with them. Okay, um, some people had the concern that this might have certain unintended effects. And so two social scientists, Amanda Egan and Sonia Starr, did the following thing. They watched particular jurisdictions right as they're about to introduce beyond the box policies. They went back to um, Marianne Bertrand and Sendel Malathan's resume study where they would send out resumes with names that only differed in the race that the employer would likely assume that the applicant belonged to. They did this resume study just before beyond the box uh, was introduced when people still checked for criminal records and they did it after. And what they found was after the introduction of this policy, the gap in callback rates, the racial gap increased, right? Now, many things could be going on, but their, their conjectured mechanism, right? Given that this happened right at the boundary um, was that once people could no longer learn about past criminal histories, they were unfortunately, you know, and perniciously falling back on other proxies, right? They, they, were, they were increasingly loading up on um, on other information to, to try increasing that disparity, to try getting at this thing that they were no longer allowed to access. So these are some of the dangerous things that happen once we introduce simplification. This is not to say that one or the other is necessarily a, a, a good idea, that simplification is only bad or only good, more that there's a trade-off what's going on. I want to mention a second thing that's interesting with simplification, which is suppose again, I had my simplified rule here. And again, I care about efficiency, the average F value that I'm hiring. And I care about equity. I care about the fraction of applicants from group D who I'm successfully hiring. Now, I could talk about, is there a way to simultaneously improve on both of these? 
right? Is there a Pareto improvement in efficiency and equity? And I could say that if I have two F approximators, G and H, that H strictly improves on G in efficiency if for every admission rate, it's at least as good and strictly better for some admission rate. And H strictly improves on G in equity if the same thing holds for uh, the fraction of members of group D who are admitted. So here's an interesting thing. If I had the approximator on the right, then I could say, you know, with a little more effort, I could create a program for which members of group D, I spend the effort, I spend the expense to collect variable X2. And I also use that. And people who have X1 equal X2, both equal to one, who are from group D, I admit them first with a value of F equals one, right? So this is effectively a kind of program that we see in many contexts where I'm going to essentially spend extra resources looking at the credentials of people in the disadvantaged group. And what I discover is the classifier, the admission rule on the left with this three-line truth table is strictly better in efficiency, right? We're doing better on F and strictly better in equity. I have not sacrificed equity. Uh, I've not sacrificed efficiency to gain equity. I've actually improved both simultaneously through this expenditure of extra effort. Now, so in some sense, the simple rule was Pareto improvable. It did not represent the best trade-off between efficiency and equity because I could simultaneously improve both by doing one extra thing. So that's sort of the picture that, that we have as we walk around on the landscape of truth tables here, each representing some admission rule. I start with the full truth table, which may be too complicated. I take a step where I simplify it. And now I'm at this sort of unstable point where sort of two things can happen. Um, one, I can fall into incentivized bias where I have this incentive to collect the group membership. And the other is I could move toward Pareto improvement. I could simultaneously improve both the efficiency and the equity of the rule. And the basic results that Sentel and I um, were able to show in this, in this model is that this is a general feature of essentially all Boolean functions. Um, namely, for every Boolean function, these, these two properties, for every Boolean function with real value outputs that satisfies this disadvantage condition for two groups A and B, um, imposing a generosity assumption, which I won't, won't get into uh, in the interest of time. Um, and for every simplification of it, namely partitioning feature vectors into cells by fixing variables, then two things happen. One, the simplification is always Pareto suboptimal. There's always an F approximator that strictly improves on G in both efficiency and in equity. Um, it, not necessarily the original rule F, but some other F approximator. And secondly, if G does not use group membership, but it's a proper simplification of F, then adding group membership as a variable simultaneously increases efficiency and reduces equity. Increases efficiency, meaning there's an incentive to use group membership, and reduces equity, meaning that use of group membership becomes pernicious. Okay? And so effectively, this is something we should keep in mind when we think about simplifications of rules, and not just in an algorithmic context, but arguably it maps very closely onto the kinds of mechanisms that people talk about when they discuss why discrimination may be arising in practice. Um, there's a more detailed formulation here, which I will jump over in the interest of, uh, of time. Um, and let me just uh, sort of wrap up with some, some uh, thoughts on all this. So yeah. I have a small question about yeah. the, the result you mentioned. So you said that yeah. uh, it strictly improves. Do you quantify it in terms of the gap between G and F or is it just uh, an existential, yes, there's something that strictly improves that we don't know exactly by all much? Yeah, so because we don't really know about the actual values of f. Uh, so in some sense, this is an arbitrary real valued Boolean function. And so it's going to depend on what values, what actual values f takes. Um, given the values of f that f takes, there is an actual constructive procedure that talks about how to produce the, the improvement. So in principle, it's possible to work out a gap from that. But it's, it's going to be dependent on the actual values that f takes. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I think there's sort of another, a bunch of other um, issues that we can think about here. Um, namely, I've been talking here about a particular kind of simplicity where we collapse rows of the truth table into cells. There are other kinds of simplification that look quite different. So syntactic simplification. What if I took my Boolean function f and said, I'm going to find a linear approximator to it, or I'm gonna find some other simplified functional form that doesn't shrink the table, but gives me an implicit way to compute entries in the table. Um, I think, that becomes an interesting question, what happens with those notions of simplification? And similarly, there is implicitly this landscape of all possible truth tables obtained by collapsing rows 
And mapping that space in terms of the efficiency and equity of the rules that you get, I think is an interesting, interesting category of questions. So more broadly, all of this is the result of an attempt to study some of the ways in which algorithms operate in cases where there is disadvantage between groups, distinguishing really between structural disadvantage that exists in the world and bias that enters the decision-making process. And I think one of the things that's very appealing about this line of research is the ways in which algorithms pose interesting contrasts to human decision-making. There are certain ways in which they're genuinely more explicit than the kinds of decisions that humans make. And so when we think about bias and algorithms, we are really encountering genuinely new questions. It's really not a case of porting what we know about discrimination over to the case of algorithms. It's really a case of having to ask genuinely new questions because of the really the new level of explicitness that we have in the decision processes that we're talking about and the ways in which bias can enter those processes. And I think what's appealing is that really many fields are going to have to play a role in setting these priorities. It certainly has been, I found very interesting and very rewarding to work with economists, policy researchers and legal scholars in these kinds of questions. And I think that perhaps is sort of a microcosmic example of the kind of activity that we're gonna need more broadly as fields come together to look at these challenging questions going forward. Thanks very much. Oh, I think you're on mute, Barna, if you were saying. So let's go with the question answer. Like, if you have a question, feel free to ask. So, so if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask the question. So Thomas is asking, really a question of Albert Sorry, I wasn't able to hear your uh, question. So there is a question, uh, is simplifying a function? This is a question from Thomas Lee. So is simplifying a function really a question of algorithmic design or a question of variable selection? So he says the former seems like a generalizable CS question while the latter seems like managerial in nature. Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh... Right, so I think there's both a computational and a representational aspect. So the, the question as I've asked it here is really to think about, um, so the, the formal uh, definition of um, simplification that we're using in this work is really to partition the rows of the truth table into uh, a collection of cells where each cell is determined by fixing the values of certain variables and leaving other variables unrestricted. That's more general than variable selection. So for example, <clears throat> a decision tree would have that property because it's going to partition the space into subcubes, uh, each of which would be a cell under our definition. And in fact, there are other partitions that would satisfy our definition uh, without, even, without being achievable by a, a decision tree. So simplification in our context is simply, I'm going to cluster the world into subcubes and treat each subcube uh, as an aggregate with an average F value. And in that sense, there's not an algorithmic question at that level. There is then the algorithmic question of, for example, searching over possible sim simplifications. Um, so I think in both cases, computational types of reasoning can be 
useful. I, I think, first of all, the question we're talking about here is really inherently combinatorial because what's happened is, we're, let's imagine we're talking about variables, all of which have been say, you know, approved in a legal or re regulatory sense. None of these are forbidden variables. You're allowed to use all of these, but you may end up with a rule that's simply too complicated to either be implementable um, or to be sort of comprehensible to humans. And so you may be searching for simplifications of it for reasons other than legal or regulatory restrictions. I think there's, there's also a very interesting computational question here, which is obviously one reason we simplify is for out of sample performance in a, a prediction algorithm, right? We might be doing this because we are regularizing. This was defined by a decision tree and we're making a shallow decision tree or we're projecting. Um, and so it suggests there's this something that we have not um, worked out because this model is really a worst case model, but in a generative model of data where we think about out of sample performance, this suggests that there may be a tension between regularization and equity of the rule that, that you obtain. That the act of regularizing uh, may actually be at odds with the goals of fairness and equity. And I think trying to sort of extend these, these results to a, a generative framework where you could actually try making those claims, I think would be very interesting. Okay, any more questions? Well, I have actually one, one more, uh, one more question. Uh, Thank you. So just one more announcement. There's a question. Oh, there's a question. Uh, yeah, just a general question. So based on what you said, is it like, is it sorry, fair to say that uh, talking about a trade-off between fairness and accuracy is actually possibly misguided and there need not be any trade-off like that? Yeah, I mean, I. I think in general, um, I, my, my sense in general is when people talk in general terms about a fairness accuracy trade-off, that's much too broad a statement because certainly I can construct situations where the two work against each other. And as we've seen, we can also be in situations, actually in this case, quite general situations where the two might actually be working in alignment with each other. As in this case, if I have a rule that I've simplified by collapsing rows of my truth table in this particular formalism, then in fact, um, <clears throat> unsimplifying it is something which is improving both fairness and uh, accuracy at the same time, or fairness or equity and goodness of fit in the legal formalism here. So I think it's, it, it is sort of um, in general sort of, uh, sort of imprecise and certainly too sweeping to talk about a sort of general research question around fairness, accuracy, trade-offs because they aren't always trade-offs. Um, it's also not the case that they're never trade-offs. And so I think it's, it's, it more becomes a question to, to assess, you know, am I in a given model or am I in a given domain or am I, or am I at a given point in the space of decision rules where the two are sort of working in, con in no, conflict no, or no, 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 no. Yeah. I think Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions?